Hello and welcome to another installment of History Hack. I'm so excited. Tell everybody why I'm excited, Alina. Alex is so excited because she actually went and begged for this subject. With no Literally. shame. No shame, begging. But anyway, we have Helen Joe with us. She's a historian, award-winning author, speaker and broadcaster. Her latest book is called The SS Great Britain, but she is here to talk about something completely different. Go on, Alex. Smuggling! Yay! This was like, I literally, I think I even used the little Shrek cat face with the please on Twitter to try and get somebody uh, to volunteer for this. And Helen did. Thank you so much, Helen. Not at all. It's one of my favourite topics as well. I love it. This was all born out of me finding an old smelly book in a shop and going around Cornwall as well and wanting to know more about it. Because this is like a rich part of Britain's history, I think, as an island. Um, And you're working on something completely different now. So thank you for taking sort of a step back, although you do have to do a smuggling book because I would so buy it and make everybody else buy it as well. (laughs) It would do a good smuggling book. Absolutely. Let's start at the beginning. Um, how easy is it to track smuggling from the 18th century? Is there much evidence available? Well, it's, it's that, the, the, you put your finger on the problem with evidence. That's one of the reasons I think many um, serious researchers have avoided it, because there's been so much romance around the whole topic. And, and yet smugglers didn't leave much in the way of, of information about their illegal activity. Can't think why. But, you know, they didn't. But what you can do is you can get at it from different angles. Mm. Obviously from legal cases, yes, but those tend to be skewed sometimes. But if you're lucky, you can come actually come up against some accounts, you know, some business accounts and things from which you can deduce what's going on and just put all the bits of jigsaw together. I love it. It reminds me of that episode. There's a couple of references actually in Only Fools and Horses when Rodney's trying to keep accounts and, and Del Boy goes mad because he doesn't want him to keep any evidence as to what they've been up to. And it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? it very much so. Very much so. Um, the particular, uh, when I first got interested in this, I was pointed by somebody to some records in the National Archives um, at Kew who said there's some very good stuff about shipbuilding in the 18th century, which is a topic I was doing at the time. But it wasn't until I looked at those ones, I realised they were part of a large chancery case where somebody had taken uh, another their shipbuilding partner to court. And this shipbuilding partner was very reluctant to put his accounts into the court. And it, it, you know, it didn't put them in for about, I think he managed to hold out for 15 years. And when they eventually appeared, you could see why, because when you fed it through and linked it with other things, it showed that he was building smuggling vessels. So I have, um, I've got this kind of romanced idea, I'm going to put my hands up for this, really sorry, Um, of men in the dark, on the beach, in the moonlight, and they're smuggling (laughs) barrels of various goods on the beach. Maybe a little oil lamp. Exactly. Yes, yes, and it all links in with some of the wreckers' tales, luring, same sort of romanticised idea of luring ships onto the rocks. These are all linked together, these these images and these myths. And it was, uh, it it was not, there were a lot of people involved, um, not doing it in a sort of, you know, just a moonlit night. You don't do that because the revenue men are going to spot you. Dark. Or you might drop them off um, by a handy lobster pot. You know, you, you sink your, your goods offshore. And then funnily enough, the next day, somebody comes out with their, with their little boat to do a bit of fishing, check their lobster pots, and picks up some of these. So that happens. But you've also got uh, daytime things happening, because some of it was quite open. You've got barrels being unloaded from, from vessels in quiet coves, and pack loads of donkeys... Um, being taken across Cornwall, for instance, um, openly. So it's not as kind of, you know, illicit and, and, and hidden as you might think. So in terms of smuggling, what different roles are there for people who are playing this game? Well, it, they were um, involved in all sorts of different ways. You had local fishermen who were involved in helping with the coastal bit. Mm -hmm. You then had mariners who were going further 
and heading over to places like the Channel Island. Channel Island is a massive um, um, involvement with the merchants there who were selling the goods quite legally. They were selling the goods. The illegal bit was bringing them into um, the UK without paying taxes because the, those taxes didn't apply to the Channel Islands. And they'd also go across to the coast of France and bring goods across as well. Um, they'd be bringing in other goods quite normally, but they'd bring in a lot of these smaller goods in and just unloading them on the shores. So just simplistic. That easy. Well, <laughs> easy but risky. It, it was. The, the customs were not well organised. Mm -hmm. um, and as you get towards the latter end of the 18th century, as you well throughout the 18th century, England's at war practically every decade, and and particularly the south coast is very vulnerable because you've got a lot of privateering going on, um, and so the smugglers can take the the opportunity to to collect the goods and bring them in because the officials are involved in other things. Is it? organized crime is it on a huge scale like that or is it more opportunistic in local communities or is it just an individual that would know someone who would get them stuff i i, I like that question because a lot of the popular literature is focused on these certain individuals and tell you know lovely stories around particular individuals there was john you know jack rattenbury in in, in devon um, and there's uh, other characters in uh, you know, further along the coast. But when you look at these people, you realise that actually what's behind it is a well-organised business. And you have these characters are organising things in, in every, every business, every uh, situation. You need someone to manage the resources, to put up the money in the first place to buy the goods. You know, a simple fisherman or, or you know, somebody who's a master mariner of a vessel is not going to be able to do this on a large scale. So you have somebody else who's giving the money, organising it, and then organising the distribution and sale of the goods when they come back in. Because you need a market, a ready-made market, in, as you do in any other business, to sell the goods. I love that you find in houses in Cornwall, don't you, um like little cubby holes and places where they used to hide stuff. Yes, um, you do find that, and there's lots of stories. You know, you might find a tunnel, and sometimes, oh, that's a smuggler's tunnel. How much you believe that? It's you know, sometimes they're folk stories, but certainly we've got some evidence from um, one character who was a, a local constable in Mevagizzi in the south, South Cornwall, and. Being, he was a, a, a cooper, he was all, and he was involved, like most people, multi-employed. And being a constable meant that if the the customs man came to um, try and deliver a warrant for a smuggler's arrest, he had to help them. But he was well um, situated within the uh, community, and so this character would very carefully lead the customs official to the wrong person. Meanwhile, having been seen walking through the town, the two of them, the real smuggled goods were removed quietly out of the way and out of town. What kind of things were smuggled? Um, brandy, liquors of all kinds. But one of the things that um, is often not spoken about very much was actually silk. Um, lovely French silk was smuggled quite a lot, and that's small and easily brought in. One of the things you find in a place like Mevagizzi, which was a hotbed of smuggling in, in the, the 18th century, was a lot of um, businesses called mercers, and they specialised in fine fabrics. So the ladies of Mevagizzi, which is today largely thought of as a, a simple fishing village, were extremely well-dressed. I think this was, did we not speak a little bit um, with Serena Dyer, didn't we, Alina, when she was talking about buying British, when we were obviously scrapping with the French a lot in this period, and there's all sorts of embargoes, isn't it, which is why it's necessary for us to get all of this cool French stuff like brandy and silk illegally. Well, the, the, Napoleon's encouraging it. Mm. Napoleon's actively encouraging smuggling. And what he is telling his um, people is, make sure you take gold. 
because what he was trying to do was drain the the the, the, the government's um, coffers, the treasury coffers, so they couldn't put so much money towards the the war. And so he was saying, sell any you know, sell all this stuff to the smugglers, but make sure you get gold. He's such a rat bag, wasn't he? <laughs> so you know, all you know, so Channel Islands and Entrepôts Roscoff, places like that were supplying uh, all of these goods. And at the same time, you've got tea being smuggled at, at, in the sort of the mid-18th century. There's some very, very good work done about the, the coast of, the, of Scotland um, on the sort of the, the, the English-Scottish border, Eyemouth, where the uh, Swedish East India Company was helping smuggle volumes of tea in from Gothenburg, quite openly again. You just don't think of it. You think it's all the channel, don't you? It's going on all around the coast. It's going on on the coast of Ireland as well. Uh, it's going on in um, Kent. But we, we think, we tend to think particularly about the Cornish ones, and we do have quite a bit of information now about them. In the media and films, smuggling's portrayed as very exciting, isn't it? Violent, people fighting, uh, authorities getting involved. Is there any truth in this at all, or was it necessarily just a very quiet occupation? Well, that's an area we're still working on. That the Kent smugglers were particularly known for their for their violence. But again, some interesting researchers suggested that some of the more lurid newspaper accounts on that, or uh, and, and court cases, might have been more politically motivated. If we look at Cornwall, which is the area I've done more work on, there is very very little incident of actual violence. There was one revenue man killed. But that's one, the only one we can find. Mm. Um, you can hear a lot of, of cases where smugglers have been um, trying to in, have been tried to intimidate the officials. You know, weapons have been waved around, and and you know they, they surround one. As I say, the the officials, the revenue men, the custom men, were desperately undermanned, and so could easily be scared off. So it's been more about scaring them off and, and threatening and intimidating. Uh, or, or trying to just bemuse them in various ways, lead them. What, <laughs> what's the best story that you can think of off the top of your head about um, smugglers being caught and trying to evade the law? Are there any anecdotes you can give us? Well, I have to say, one of my favourite ones involves, involves the most senior um, constitutional body in the United Kingdom. This happened in 1793, at the time when we have the uh, French Revolutionary Wars going on. And a revenue cutter came out of Falmouth and spotted what he recognised as a smuggling vessel called the Clausina. And it was hovering off the coast, hovering, just kind of obviously waiting to, to land its cargo somewhere. And a chase ensued. And, we, and this happened over two days and three nights. So they're chasing each other around the, the, the channel. The Clausina eventually heads back into the Channel Islands and beaches in St. Peterport. The uh, official leaps out thinking, oh, I've got you now, rushes over and tries to arrest the men on the Clausina, only to find that the official from the Channel Islands don't want to engage with this. And they say, well, the anti-smuggling laws don't apply in the Channel Islands. <laughs> <laughs> the revenue officer, frustrated, has to go back, complain to his uh, superiors who are in the Treasury. The Treasury sort of scratches their head and thinks, OK, how are we going to manage this one? Uh, Channel Islands, is true, are not part of English juris legal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. so the only place they could take this one case of this one smuggler is the Privy Council. <laughs> I bet that's just exactly the kind of thing they want dumped on their desk. Oh right at the moment, when they're in the middle of a war with France, you know, they, do they really want to deal with this one vessel sitting in St. Peterport? Anyway, they, they, they consult their lawyers and all the rest, and they say, oh, yes, it must be brought back to be, you know, um, seen in, in an in a English court. So the, the revenue officer... Uh, rushes back to uh, St. Peterport, only to discover, of course, that the Clausina is long gone. <laughs> Unsurprisingly so. Yes. <laughs> so how important, sorry, sorry, again, how supportive were the local communities, especially the local courts? It's often been, it's been described, smuggling and 
poaching, which went on quite, quite um, in quite a big way in, in the 18th century. These two have been described as a social crime. And, and by that, uh, what they mean is that's something that the local communities don't see as, you know, particularly legal. It's something that, that supports them, particularly if you've got poor communities. And they don't see it as a big problem. It's a problem for somebody else. And so you've got in Cornwall you've, that the local communities support what's going on. You've got, you might have families where one brother is a smuggler, uh, the other brother is involved in something else, but they're not going to tell on one another. And you, so they are very supportive, and you've even got the local justice of the peace keeping fairly quiet about it. There was a famous case uh, that happened in actually the early 19th century, where some smugglers were apprehended um, not far from where I am now on the south coast of Cornwall. Mm -hmm. And they were apprehended and taken to court and were threatened with um, having a dangerous weapon, which happened to be all the smugglers were armed with cudgels. Okay. And the jury let them off because they said that they were walking sticks and therefore not dangerous weapons. Right. That sounds because I mean, especially with support of like local communities. So I guess people that live there looking the other way because cause they're benefiting from the, the industry, aren't they? They are indeed. I mean, there was a case of one um, smuggler in in Mavagizzi got very drunk and threatened to tell, and, and actually did tell the, the local officials uh, what was going on, and they whisked him away for um, victim in a victim protection. And they put him on a ship in the middle of Plymouth Sound. Well, the man who was the, the Mr. Big of that area was a chap called James Dunn. And he went to um, one of his men and explained that, you know, we need to sort this out. And so the story goes that uh, Stephen Dunn, his cousin, then went over and did a bit of fishing in Plymouth Sound. Message had got through that the original man who told on them was feeling rather guilty, he'd sobered up. So they rescued him and whisked him away for their version of victim protection. No way. It's really weird, isn't it? Smuggling, I mean, this, exactly the same thing is still going on now. I, I, was, so I was in the Musandam Peninsula earlier this year, which is a little bit of a man that sticks right up, and it's like, I think it's even less from there to Iran than it is um, to the English Channel, or it's about the same or I've just lost my mind, but basically there's a quid pro quo going on where I think it's mutton or lamb that the Iranians or goat, so some form of meat that the Iranians smuggle out every morning, like tons of motorboats come across this stretch of water and mm -hmm. the meat ends up in Dubai yeah. and in return goes all this stuff against the embargoes that the US has got on Iran. So electronics um, and Coca-Cola randomly. So, I mean, it goes on in yeah. all sorts of places where there's a, a you know there's a profit to be had, mm. and where people think the, the, the either the laws are crazy, uh, and, and people have a need. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, what's the dumbest thing you've ever heard of being smuggled? Ooh, well, that's a good one. I can't I can't <laughs> think of anything at the moment. Because <laughs> goats for me was a bit like, but apparently it's because from this peninsula to Dubai is only a couple of hours by road, and they just it's this quality of the meat that makes it <gasps> desirable, uh, and the taste of it, and the people then the Emirates particularly obsessive about it, which is why it is so necessarily so there's so many boats coming over. With animals in. Mm. Oh, God, that's fascinating. Because when you say, like, I went out of my way to, I nearly pissed off the Americans and I was mm. smuggling in the Middle East for a goat or a sheep, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but it is actually sensical when you look at it. But, but again, you know, that's all something that's supported by the local populace because they can see the need. They and and everyone everyone wins from it as far as they're concerned. It's only kind of in the, the big authorities who are some distance away. Well, no, the the late Sultan mm. just as his policy was to turn a blind blind eye. I don't yeah. know if that will change now, but the the late Sultan, who of course they adore, 
because they only had three kilometers of roads in Amman before he came to the throne. But yeah, it's, so it was the, the big authorities were just not interested in stopping it. It's it's what brings an economy into that area, which would otherwise be deserted, I think. So everybody's winning. Mm. Can I throw one in the hat? Go on then. It's not from this uh, from this century, though. Uh, it's something slightly modern. Not not my modern, but slightly modern. Um, when they used to smuggle mummies. Oh, yeah. Well, you, when they were pillaging all of the Egyptian tombs. Yeah. And they used to smuggle dead bodies literally, because they were, into the UK for people to gawk at. Uh, Yeah, that is quite a dumb one, isn't it? uh, Is that why would you, or they would have some of the rich people would have a a, a mummy in their house. I mean, I'm really sorry, but having a a, a recently dead person in your house, for me, is, I can't correlate and understand that, but having a million, not a million, but... A couple of thousand year old mummy. I just, I just keep thinking it would come alive. I don't know. I'd give it a name. It'd be like a little mascot. I went to someone's house once and they had a giant bear that their ancestor had shot in Canada in the 19th century stuffed. And they kind of like, he was stood up as if he was roaring and stuffed. And they used to shake hands with him when they came home. And he was holding a tray that everyone left their keys on. <laughs> what? I think I'd do something like that with the mummy. I'd call him Dave or something and it'd become like a, I'm not saying I would smuggle a mummy, but if one ended up in my house. <laughs> Anyway, call it, call it Charles. <laughs> Charles, and he can hold your keys for you every day. <laughs> Revenue men, you mentioned them briefly. Um, so they are the authorities, aren't they? Who are they? Where do they recruit them from? Um, were they locals as well? Because then they're coming into conflict with people, aren't they? And what exactly did they do? And this is such, sorry, how did smugglers manage to outwit them? Well, the revenue men were largely um, brought in from elsewhere. Revenue men, they, they want to bring in from elsewhere because you, as we've seen, the, the locals will support one another. So if you're going to bring somebody in to, the revenue men were the people on the water and they needed to have boats that were as fast as the smugglers boats. So if they did manage to confiscate a smugglers boat, they would then often take that smugglers boat into their own use because it would be as fast in order to catch them. They had, they were very often um, revenue men who were ex-naval officers um, and who weren't you know, fit perhaps to go for in the main part of the Navy, but were therefore put on this kind of coastal patrol. But they were um, undermanned badly and were frequently, uh, they would, the locals would run rings around them because the locals would know more about what was going on than the revenue man would. I don't want to reach the end of this because I'm finding this too interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it really is, isn't it? So the big question is, why did smuggling end? Well, smuggling never finished. There's mm. smuggling as we know going on today and it's gone on for centuries. But the really sort of open smuggling where I mentioned earlier where you've got, you know, groups of pack horses, 25, 30 at a time, taking these goods across Cornwall and distributing stuff. Uh, That really comes to an end in the early part of the 19th century. Up until then, you've got across the the south coast of Cornwall, you've got the big organisers like the wonderfully named Zephaniah Job in Polperro. You've got James Dunn, who I mentioned, who's managing the the coast around the Gizzi. You've got the Duncan brothers, who are in Penzance. And you've got uh, the, the King of Prussia, as he's known, and his brother, who are also working in Mount Bay. Now, they're all managing it, and they're managing the whole business with the merchants in Guernsey. So they're handling the business with the merchants and other places across along the channel. What really stops the whole thing is cutting off the supply. After Trafalgar, the Navy controls the channel. And the English government is able to extend anti-smuggling laws to cover the Channel Islands. Up until then, they hadn't done that because the big worry was the Channel Islands might declare for Napoleon. Um. So with Trafalgar, uh, with 1805, they've got the control. So they extend the anti-smuggling laws to cover the Channel Islands. The merchants on the on the islands um, who've been openly selling these goods and legally selling them, 
suddenly decide they're not going to have anything to do with the smuggling business anymore. It's too risky. And what is then interesting is that the wonderfully named Zephaniah Job, who is also you know, a regular businessman, he's a merchant, he's trading with the Navy uh, legally, but he's also running this smuggling business. His smuggling activities more or less come to an end around about 1806. James Dunn, also a legitimate businessman, uh, shipbuilder, his activities finish around about 1807. And the same thing with the other names I've mentioned, the Duncans, etc. So they've cut off the supply. And again, after Trafalgar, there's more uh, naval ships to patrol the channel. Yes, because also as well, like, it's that um, evolution of the Royal Navy, isn't it, um, in sort of a police force, if you like, on, on the seas. There's less Frenchies to take care of, so they are they sort of start focusing on things like smuggling and slavery, don't they? Yeah, and, and, and you know, and smuggling does continue, but it has now to be more hidden, mm. whereas you could bring the stuff in openly in, in, in the vessels. Now they have to be hidden in other cargoes. This is, it's from this time on you start hearing stories about um, you know, special compartments and, you know, different ways of hiding things. Uh, so it becomes much more hidden smuggling than in the 19th century. We've talked about sources and we did briefly touch on sort of cubby holes and tunnels and things like that. So what is there left that we can see of this illegal activity? Not not a great deal. I mean, if you went to somewhere like Mervagizzi, which was... Oh, you know, an absolute hub of, of smuggling activity. You just think of it as a normal, you know, Cornish fishing village today. So there's very little left. But if you do go into the museum in Medigizzi, there's the most wonderful painting of, of, a, of a local man who looks, you know, terribly respectable. And that's Captain James Dunn, the, the one who I said was one of the key organisers. And the other thing that's linked to him, you've got this wonderful portrait of him looking terribly respectable. But if you go to Truro Cathedral, which was built in the 19th century, going in through the, the main door there, on the right-hand side, there is a window which is dedicated to Wesley. But it's also dedicated to Captain James Dunn. So it's generally known as the smuggler's window. Ah, so there is something that people can go and see. Yes. Lockdown rule pending. Indeed. Helen, thank you so much for coming on to fulfil my needy demand for a smuggling podcast. I'm really excited to do a Wreckers one as well soon. Um, we have found someone for that as well. But thank you so much for coming on to tell this story because I think it's brilliant. <laughs> it's you need a Netflix series. <laughs> yes. And join us tomorrow when Catherine Spears will be with us to talk all about a history of dessert. Uh, this was Alina's dream come true, so don't miss that one. And then join us down the pub when they will be debating history's greatest sexcapade. So um, they were all being smutty in the group chat, so I decided to own them. And now they have to go and find the funniest sex story from history and try and make each other laugh. And then to make it even more amusing for the rest of us, Zach White's going to be a guest judge because... Uh, every time he utters a naughty word, it's hysterical. And then join us on Saturday because we have another Sharp special for you. This time it's Sharp's Eagle. We have a number of the cast with us. Absolutely brilliant, full of fun. So don't miss out on that one. We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe. Don't forget, you can become a patron of History Hack for as little as a dollar a month. Just go to www.historyhack.podbean.com. It will help us keep going in the aftermath of the coronavirus and we would really appreciate it as we would love to do so.